Frasco! What up, dude? It's your boy Dolav. Just wanted to hit you up and say, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Signing some fucking world-saving athletes? Are you kidding me? You don't know shit about sports? You ain't no fucking athlete. You trying to sign some fucking Twin Towers? What are you doing signing them? You can't even afford to pay Gerlach, let alone your band. You're going to pay some fucking athletes to, to rep your shit? You ain't shit. Lakers ain't shit. Get the fuck out of here, bro. Hello, Andy Frasco. This is Bob Watson with the Mount Union University Sports Information Office. Just got the finalized paperwork for your sponsorship deal with our two uh, seven-footers on the bench there. Looking great. Love the uh, clothes you sent over. I'm a little surprised at how ready you were for this industry and how just as much of a pro you are. Do you have some sort of experience as a college basketball player or an athlete? It just seems like you're a former athlete. Um, we've never had anyone really understand this industry so well right away. Give us a call back if you need anything. Sorry, I'm texting. You done this, texting? This is Andy fucking Frasco. so fucking rude. <laughs> Fuck you, you piece of shit. <laughs> And we're back. Andy Frasca's World Series. The first word from the Potter. Fuck you, you piece of shit. Do not edit that out. I feel good about that. I stand by that. Oh, how we doing, everyone? Woo! Um, we just did an amazing interview with John. And it went long. And AKA we're on it, Barber. So we don't need to give you one of our from long Disco opening. Biscuits. Yeah, so we're not going to do a long one for you. But it's a long do, one. This is a long one, and we're not going to edit it because he is a borderline low key genius. I think he might just be a genius. I think he's beyond borderline. I think borderline. he might be one of the smartest. I think I'm a borderline genius. I think he's a real genius. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up, Nick. I said I'm only borderline. Um, wow, that was amazing. Disco Biscuits. Everyone says me and him needed to talk, and um, I'm glad he's... In some ways he you do. A, in some ways. In some ways you should never meet. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I thought he was more of a... Aloof? I thought he was more aloof than that. Me too. I, I've opened for him a few times, but I always just kind of kept my distance with him because he's kind of scary. You I know? also thought he was a druggie. No, I never got that vibe from him. I don't get why everyone thinks like Cause he's Disco like, Biscuits is a drug band. Well, they played Have dance you met music. their audience? Oh, yeah, true. Sometimes that's driven by the audience's consumption. True, true, true. Um, so we're just going to go straight to the interview because um, Barber deserves the whole 90. So Yeah, for sure. Um, Dialed in Gummies is our sponsor for this show. Dialed in Gummies. Hell yeah. Tell, tell them about Dialed in Gummies. Well, I'd love to tell them about Dialed in Gummies, wouldn't I? I had four <laughs> of them last night. I what? couldn't sleep. You do 100 milligrams of that? Four of them. That's 40. 10. Oh, you have 40. Yeah. And I was having, I've been having problems sleeping. It knocked me out finally. Um, they are solventless. I mean, they're the cleanest gummy out right, there. Right, right. Everybody's into eating clean these days. You mm. might as well do it with your THC too, not just your <laughs> salads. You know yes, what I'm saying? Yes, yes. They taste great. They actually make you lose weight. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. Um, <laughs> what else? They're homogenous. They're I actually all, get all... fucking hungry after eating those. Yeah, I'll, that's I'll, a common I'll... thing. Really? Some I... weed doesn't make me hungry. Some weed makes me hungry. I think eat. eating weed makes me hungry more than smoking it. Yeah, 100%. I agree. I agree. It gets into your body more. Right, right, right. Um, I love them. They're delicious. I eat them every day. I stand by them. If anyone ever has an issue with them, you are dead to me. They are my <laughs> favorite thing on earth. And they're affordable, and they're at Kush Club right now. Yes. Our, our specific uh, tin, your yep. specific tin. Our tin, world Yours. Saving. I think it's the band. Let's give it... The band, too. People are here for you, not me. It's fine. I'm like icing. You're the cake. Oh, that's sweet. You're a big piece of cake. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet, Nick. I dip uh, you in milk. <laughs> ooh, hot. Ew, that was the hottest thing Eric actually ever said to me. Really? I'm going to dip you in milk? I'm <laughs> kind of hot. I mean, if you're you, yeah. I was eating Oreo cookies last night. I was you dipping were? them in milk, and it was really good. Double stuff, single stuff, single stuff. I don't fuck with the two hard months. agree. I like the single stuff too. The double stuff, it's like get over yourself. Yeah, I feel like an American in yeah. Europe. Yeah, you know? come on. <laughs> we're not communists here. What about just a big jar of those fillings? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God. All right, so we got. We said short and sweet, Nick. Short and sweet. Disco biscuits, splice, tech. Yeah, this the is jam band. Everything. Thing. This talks. We talk about AI. AI. We talk about. Fights. Fights. Punching. Him and him and Brownie fighting. Yeah. We talk Good about fights. music. We talk about operas. We talk about his tech companies. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, if you don't know who uh I'll even do the intro right now. Let's just kill it all right do now. It. Barber, guitar player of the Disco Biscuits. Everyone, you know, you know the Disco Biscuits in our scene. They are a transy disco trans trance, not trans. trans. Oh no, yeah. Trance. <laughs> They're not transy. <laughs> God, yes. I love you sometimes. Yeah, I can't. You know, I'm dyslexic. Uh, are you? Or do you just have problems pronouncing stuff? I think I'm just stupid. 
You're not stupid. I hate when you say that. You just don't know a lot of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, you think I'm smart? I think you're very smart. I just don't think you know very much. Okay. But I think you're very smart. Okay. Does Let's that get make back. Sense? Uh, thanks, bud. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Barber's the guitar player of the Disco Biscuits. This is one of my... This might be one of my favorite interviews. Margaret Cho was pretty badass. Phil Hanley was pretty badass. But this one, because I know him, mm -hmm. this one might take the cake so far for the year. Mm. I don't think Barber is interviewed a lot. No, he. I've hardly ever seen him be interviewed. The only thing when I did the little research was something from like three years ago. I yeah. Find. Yeah. Well, this interview is sponsored by our boys, Repsy.com. They're back. Com. They're back. <laughs> They're back. Repsy.com. Okay. Go grab yourself a talent booker from the internet. Mm. How important is a talent booker, Nick? Very important. I also saw another service they were offering the other day that I'd like to highlight. What? They're doing this thing where basically if you're a frat or a sorority, I guess, and uh -huh. you're, you're the social chair, they'll work with you directly to make sure you're staying within budget and meeting all the... the oh! Because I guess there's a, there's a, probably a lot of rules and stuff that goes with that shit. Yeah. Because you know frats are getting in trouble all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, erased i think yeah that, i think that's a good service to check out too. i love oh my yeah. god and they're helping out all the all the bros yeah they're helping let's go finally frats let's go finally good to see some frat boys having so if you're in a band if you're a frat guy yeah. running a frat or a sorority girl running yeah. a sorority if you're a wedding planner independent venue musician musician Comedian, candle lighter. Maybe like your gig is you just light candles. Like a Catholic altar boy? Like a Catholic altar boy. <laughs> 30 yeah. bucks an hour, I'll come. <laughs> Who would pay to watch that, old ladies? I don't know. I kind of think it's hot. Yeah, well, you think everything's hot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sign up for Repsy.com and um, get situated. Get. I mean, it's tough times right now. How hard is it for you to get a gig? It's impossible. Yes, I know. Yeah. Well. Um, it actually, it's hard, but... um. So sign up for Repsy.com before we get... Go on right now. Repsy.com while you're listening and sign your band up. Or if Yeah, they rule. It's, plan, also, they rule. it's free to sign up. Yeah, and they're OG and they're back. You can't lose. You don't give them money unless they I knew they, they weren't going to be money. gone for long. I knew like this hiatus yeah. they took, something happened. But I knew they'd be back. They're smarter than that. Let's go. You know who else? You know who else went away and came back? Who? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. <laughs> not saying. Not saying they're Jesus, but... Oh, we should also pitch. We got a lot of your voicemails, FYI, last week, which yeah. we love. We think we got like twenty or thirty yeah. of them. Hilarious. Hilarious. And good advice. We'll 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 narrow we'll them down those next week. But if you want to send a voicemail, if you want to talk shit, if you want to ask advice, if you want to um, anything, ask us on a date. We had a girl who said, "Is yes. Andy single?" Yeah, that was kind of hot. I texted her and said no. <laughs> <laughs> Send her a picture. Well, of I'm a single man now, so holler at her. Okay. Um, right in the ad, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the number. All right. What's the number? 720 area code 996 2403. Just leave a message. It's just like any other phone call. So 720 996. 2403. Go send us a voicemail and let's yeah. hear all your weird thoughts. You want to. Give me love advice. Give it to me. If you want to give Nick love advice, I'll take it. I don't care. Yeah, Nick will give love. He needs a love advice. Too. I need all kinds of advice. We all need advice. If you just want to send me your social security number and yeah, your if bank you account wanna, information, whatever. Yeah, if you just want to talk shit, we'll listen yeah. and we're gonna put it on the podcast and we're gonna talk shit right back. Right? We'll see. Okay, all right, maybe. Ladies, uh, Chris, play some disco biscuits while we uh, get ready for this interview. Yeah, key of D, baby. Are they a D band? Uh, probably E, I would guess. Yeah, cool. All right, guys. Enjoy uh, Barber from the Pick Disco Biscuits, e. and uh, we'll catch you next week. Bye. Wow. There he is. Yeah. The tell-all. Barber. Wow. <laughs> finally, someone besides Brownie. Yes, finally. Why don't... Why don't <laughs> Why does why does Brownie take all the interviews? Why don't he want to do all the interviews? That's a great question. I don't know. I think he creates them. He, he, <laughs> yeah, exactly. He hits the. He makes his interviews happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've been I've been waiting for this moment for God knows five years now. <laughs> At least. At least. How long have you been doing this podcast for? Five years. This is season six. Season six. Wow. Very beginning. Look, you guys are in seasons. You're such like television personalities. <laughs> We're professionals. Where... Look at us, two podcast stars. Yeah. <laughs> Shooting stars. Barber, you have a podcast too, don't you? 
Yeah, my podcast is like, oh, I'm just going to do another episode. There's no seasons. There's no <laughs> yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. thought to it or anything. I just <laughs> want to listen to music. I might as well do it on a podcast because, yeah. you know, you might as well... Might as well do the director's cut of the show. <laughs> <laughs> the Tarantino cut. So yeah, I got exactly. I, I kinda I got a couple things that I want to start with. First off, let's go. Uh, y- your younger life. <laughs> I yeah. you have a bunch of there's a bunch of just like just meme photos of you just looking crazy on the yard. What was the younger years <laughs> of Barber? What tell me what uh, why are you a meme? Well, I, you know, I was the last person to get a cell phone. There were nine-year-old kids with cell phones before I got one. <laughs> <laughs> and I really, really took the idea of being a traveling minstrel to heart. Yeah. And yeah. I used to go into the hotel rooms. I climbed Mount Estes in Colorado. Do you know where that is? Yeah. Past Fort Collins. Yep. yep. With an acoustic guitar on my back. And... <laughs> I was just like really that guy for a while and I used to just not put shoes on for for weeks at a time on the road like walking in and out of truck stops with oh bare feet God. people <laughs> would people would be like what the fuck is wrong with you and I was just like if if I'm going to step in glass let it happen and it would just never happen hmm. and I was just like all right I'm not going to put shoes on if I don't need to and I used to just really grizzly up. You know, I was lacking in, um, it was just like, didn't have like, I was just really into that bohemian thing. I was just really into it. I don't know if I was lacking anything. I was very happy in those years. I was just really into like writing songs and playing guitar and just chilling out and just being in a jam band, you know? So who were your, cool. who, who'd you look up to that was like living this vagabond life? I, I think you know Hunter S. Thompson did that really well. He did a great job of it. If, if when you're talking about the vagabond life, um, it was way more popular back then. But I took it to another extreme. Like I was wearing, you know, like tattered sh- like shirts with just random holes all over them, and and like now the sweatpants thing has taken hold. But back then, people wore jeans. Yeah, you know, like every <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. day. And I would wear this, like, weird stuff that now is kind of normal, but back then it was like, who the fuck is that guy? (laughs) Yeah. And I was just like, my hair was crazy, and I didn't do, I couldn't do anything to my hair. I'm sure you guys kind of know, like, Frasca, you definitely get it. Like, there is no hairspray (laughs) that's going to be victorious (laughs) on your head. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I mean... Even Aquanet, which is like nuclear war for hairspray, didn't yeah. didn't do much for me. Yeah. So I was just like in that for a long time. And everybody in my little bubble was totally happy that I was in it. And everybody outside of my little bubble couldn't get in touch with me because I didn't have any <laughs> phone or anything like that. Were you picked on in high school? Uh, everybody was. But yes, definitely me as well. Yes. Well, well, but not so much. I was like cool with everybody in high school. So I... But I had high school was the beginning of my hair related nicknames, which has followed <laughs> me through my entire life. What? What? Oh yeah. Why? Why has that happened? What is? What? Why? What's barber? Barber is is a hair related nickname. Uh, barber was when I was in college. I didn't know anyone. I I was a bioengineer, so I was breaking. I had this lab coat, right? And uh, <laughs> had my fuck? name on it, like the barber Seville. <laughs> And people would come to my room. I didn't know anybody. I was in Philadelphia. I didn't know anybody. So I would go to the liquor store and I'd buy this like $5 cheap ass vodka that you get in the super gallon because I had a dope fake ID. So I would go buy a bunch of this cheap ass vodka. And then I would be in my room. My roommate moved in with some old upperclassman girl. The day he started school, I don't know how he met her. He like literally got there. I was like, hi, nice to meet you. He's like, hey, I'm moving in with this girl. And I literally never saw him again. So I had my whole place to myself. And um, every once in a while, he would like show up and rob me and then leave. And then, um, and so I had, yeah, my roommate would just show up like once every couple of months and just like steal stuff and then leave. And I never saw him. He, he didn't go to the same class as me. I literally never saw the kid. And then, um, 
And so I'd have this chair and people would sit in the chair and I'd pour lemon juice and vodka in their mouth and then they would get up and do a trick in the room. And that was the whole process. It's true. It the rumor is true. Yeah, that's the drink called a haircut. <laughs> and so everybody knew who I was like a month into school. I had haircut. The line from my room was was legendary. Like it was thousand <laughs> it was like a thousand kids. I went through like five of those giant jugs of vodka every Thursday night. And then I would, you know, everybody would be, and then all the freshmen would get all sauced on haircuts and then go hit the campus. Uh, so we would do that from like eight to 10. And then that was how everybody met me. I didn't meet anybody doing that. I met like five people, but everybody knew who I was. And that nickname has stuck with me for my entire life. Do you regret <laughs> it? Nah. Do you I like it? Nah, I don't care. How I much money care. were you making during that? Oh, it was free. It was a free process. It cost me 60 bucks. It cost me 60 bucks a Thursday. Is what it well, cost. social collateral gained, though. So yeah. what... Nowadays, I charge for that shit. But back then, I wasn't so wise. You know what I mean? <laughs> so what was? What do you think, you know, looking back at it, why do you think you're doing that? To get friends? Or were you lonely? I don't know. I just cooked up that stupid idea just to, like, have people hang out. Yeah, I don't know. I had this whole room to myself. I didn't really know anybody, and um, there, we didn't have cell phones back then. So how do you talk to your old friends? Like, how do you you, you can't call your parents? You can't. Yeah, not not right. that I would have, but you can't. <laughs> there's no one. You can only talk to the people in your like that you could hit with a rock, right? You know what I mean around you, and and that was my way of bringing people to me, so I could you know eventually meet some of them and figure out who's who and la la la. When did you start playing music? I was playing music from like age four or five. I was playing music from very young. I had an alto sax when I was seven that I played. Um, I loved, and then I got a tenor sax when I was eight or nine, I think. I loved the tenor sax with that low G. We played. Oh, yeah. We used to play She Works Hard for the Money. You ever heard that song? She Works Hard yeah, for yeah. the Money. So hard and I for used to honey. be the guy going, burp, 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 burp. <laughs> and I'm like, that was literally my favorite thing to do. I still miss that level of joy in everyday life today. <laughs> and then when I was 13, I talked to my mom into getting me a guitar 12 or 13 or something like that. So it's been a long time. I put the guitar down many times in my life. I put music down many times in my life because I've spent so much time making music, playing music, you know, doing the thing that I've definitely like, you know, you've had, I've had these times where I put it down and then I always end up picking it back up again for one reason what, or another. What makes you burnt out about it when you're having those moments of, I got to quit this? Well, I mean, in high school, I got burnt out on it for a little bit because like, what was I doing? I was like playing in these bands and going to parties and like, do, we were playing like other kids' parties. Yeah. And we were like playing songs, you know, we would play like, and like what we we're doing was great. Like we'd play like You Enjoy Myself and we'd play like Pearl Jam songs. <laughs> like we'd play Chili Pepper songs. Like we we're playing stuff that was like, you know, probably too hard for us. I probably, I think if we went back and listened to it, we'd be like, wow, these guys needed to practice or something. <laughs> but the, ki the kids really liked it. You know, the kids at the party loved it. But then I put the guitar down and be like, wow, the party's over, you know? And, and in those days, like the party went from like eight to 12 or something. And then parents came and picked everybody up. <laughs> and so I was, I was missing all the fun. Yeah. Um, and so I was like, well, why am I doing that when I want to talk to all these people? So, so I did. So I put it down for a couple of years in high school. And then in college, I picked it back up again because I met some cool musicians. And I wanted to play with them. And um, that was Brownstein and Sammy, the old drummer. And then we kind of started the band from there. So it kind of went from there. I think in the back of my mind, I knew we were going to do stuff like this. Um, I think I remember telling my parents that I was going to be a musician and they were like mortified. Yeah. Um, so, so it was always there. The question is, you know, am I doing it this month or something? Was it hard to get approval from your parents growing up as a kid? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. What I was it like? I, my, I, my parents didn't really care what I was doing when I was a kid. They just didn't really give a shit, you know? Mm -hmm. like Yeah. Approval was something that I never got. You know, like a acknowledgement was a hard thing to get right, when yeah. I was a kid. I bet. 
Like, I, so like, I, were you always trying to get their acknowledgement your whole life? Like, you're like trying to. You think that's why you kind of isolate into your own thing because the people you wanted to make happy w- weren't giving a shit about you. I I isolate extremely well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I got COVID, uh, you know, a year and a half ago or something, I was, and it was like the COVID. You're you're alone for. 14 days, right. get used to it. You remember that right. moment of COVID yeah, yeah. where they were like, put a bag over your head and sit under the stairs for right. two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I was, yeah. and like, to me, I loved that. I I had the best 14 days ever. I just <laughs> like, I just like, I had a blast. Nobody was bothering me. <laughs> it was crazy. And then I was like, you know, at the end of it, I was like, wow, everybody's talking about how terrible COVID is. I could do that every week. I could get COVID <laughs> every week and be totally happy. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like there's a certain amount of, uh, independence and there was like the moment my parents flipped on the band on me having the band where there was like, stop that, stop that, stop that, stop that, stop that every single day until like they went to a show that there was like 15,000 people at and they were like, all right, you could do that. Yeah. And then, um, and that, and then they flipped totally. And when they flipped, I flipped the other way and was like, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> Let's go. So maybe you don't want their approval. <laughs> that's, my, that's my favorite outlaw. That's my favorite outlaw. Yeah, that's, that was weird. I now was that like, I have it, I don't want it. <laughs> so yeah. what did, okay, so when you bailed out, when you finally played for all these people, because your parents said, all right, this is cool. What did your whole band say? I mean, you know, the band knows my parents pretty well, and they just think my parents are super weird. You know, yeah. just like, your parents are super. <laughs> no, no, what'd they say when you were done, when you were over it, your first hiatus? Oh, yeah. Were they pissed? Oh, yeah, super pissed, super pissed. Like, Everyone's always super pissed at me, or at least for years, everybody was always super pissed at me. It didn't wh- I, to, in my mind, it was like, it doesn't matter what I do. Everybody's going to be pissed Why? at me. Why? Why do you there think was one, that? I don't know. People used to get mad at me for the dumbest shit. I mean, one time I got yelled at. We did a transition from basis for a day into above the waves on a dime. Like, boom, suddenly we're in this other song. And yeah, in retrospect, a little jarring. A little jarring. But, you know, it's not like you go to a Disco Biscuit show because we've worked everything out in advance. (laughs) Right. You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. It's not an Aaron Sorkin film. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to fuck up every once in a while. You know, you got to go for something and then look back at it and be like, yeah, a little jarring. But I mean, I got yelled at for that. So I, I would always get yelled at for everything. <laughs> but isn't that like the essence? Matter. Isn't that the essence of jam music? It's a lot of it. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, I feel like when you're a musician and you're on stage, everybody is very, very, uh, aggressive and and very vocal about you giving them the experience that they showed up to receive right and i feel like that is a big reason why there's a lot of artists out there who just do their thing and and a lot of the most successful artists out there are guy are people who just they do what they do. Like Drake makes an album about with house music and the whole world is like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah. How does he do that? <laughs> He's supposed to make trap music, <laughs> you know? And it's, and it's just, you know, the guy made a house, during a pandemic, he made a house album. I mean, he's got a studio, like what, well, he listens to house music, obviously. So what are you going to do? But, but to a lot of people that was sacrilegious, you know? So I feel like the biscuits, we've always had this, this thing where we do different stuff all the time and we're just doing that in the wrong generation. Like if we did that in the sixties, it'd be the best thing ever. And you do it in 2011 and 2021. And there's like, but everybody needs your band to be a brand and be consistent like Coca-Cola because they have so many different brands to choose from. They want to know when they go to your brand that it is exactly what it was last time they went there. And I get that speech all the time. And I just unfortunately can't deliver for those people. I just yeah. can't do that. Yeah. It's not that I don't want to. I get it. I get it. You want a Coke every time you open up a Coke. If I made your Coke, <laughs> there'd be a sun kissed in there every once in a while. I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> Try to enjoy the sun kiss, people. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. Exactly. I mean, I, I'm so fascinated with you've, you've wanted this approval from your parents your whole life. 
And once yeah. you got it, you're done. What it was it yeah. the same with success? Yes. Yes. I've been very bad with success my whole life. What, yeah. What it, it, what don't you like about it? What scares you about it? Give it to me. Um I mean, I have songs about it. I have a lot of songs about it. Um, you know, there's Mulberry's Dream. What would I have left to dream? Uh, there's hope. You know, is there any hope for me? There's there's like a lot of songs that I have that are about that exact moment in time where you're up late at night and you're like envisioning the future and and you're also like knowing that... Um, that you're going to end up falling through a ceiling or some shit and fucking it up. And, and, and like, that is, that's just the way it goes for me. I don't know why I don't, I don't try and do it deliberately, but I do feel like, I do feel like there's, there's so much like being in the entertainment business and being in a business like a jam band business where there is no, there's no help. There's no way to do it right. Right. There's no amount of rehearsal you can do to do something perfectly. And there's, you know, no way to to really, especially in my band where we kind of do everything poorly, but we do it really crazy way that is is very unique. Like it's hard to um to imagine that that, that is good or anything like that. You know what I mean? Or I don't know. I don't know. You know, but like, what are you searching for? In life, Barbara? Well, that's a hell of a question. <laughs> I mean, what is anyone searching for in life? It's, it's, it's basically, if you have like a real set dream in life that you wanted, like for me, like I knew from four or five that I, you know, like I went to all the outdoor venues when I was 16 on a mountain bike. And then I played all those venues right, 10 right, years yeah. later or 20 years later, even the gorge in, in Washington state, you know, I played <laughs> every single one of them and to like do all that stuff as a kid and then come back around and do it as an adult and do it like kind of against all odds. Like that there's, there's these, a lot of music groups that are just like, you know, they put out two songs and just blow up and the world just loves them. And I just feel like the Biscuits are never that band. My music career is never that. My songs are never that. And so I just sort of kind of like willing this whole thing to happen. And it has a little bit of a... Uh, it has... A, there's a little bit of inside of me that's like, well, if I could have willed this to happen, I could have willed anything to happen, you right. know? And I, and sometimes I wonder, like, what else I could have willed to happen. Yeah. And that kind of... Hesi- those kind of hesitations and that kind of, like, that kind of moving yourself, especially, like, when the going gets tough, if you can move yourself off of your trajectory, that's not a good thing. Yeah. And you need people to keep you on trajectory in those situations, and I don't have those people. I never have. I don't have those people in you my You never had like family. a manager or a friend, no one to keep you on the right track? Not really. No, mm-hmm. not really. So what got you? What gets you back on the track? Yourself? Well, I mean, the band is very, the band is good as far as like being like these guys can play and we, we you know, we're all still playing together after all these years. So the band is a lot of that, but the band has also been a lot of turmoil over the years. So it's hard to decide. You know, it's like, how do I stay on track? I don't know. I I don't know. It's a great question. I've gone. I've done a lot of things in life. You know, I, I just have done a lot of things. I was, I was like a computer programmer at a high frequency currency exchange. Yeah, in that's New York what City I wanted to talk for, about yeah. for a couple of years ago. Like, I've done a lot of <laughs> weird stuff. Yeah, and and Spice. um and interfaced with a lot of different kinds of people. And I just kind of, I like that at the end of the day. And I feel like it's really bad for your career. Like people say shit to me, like, how are you bringing the disco biscuits back after all these years and la la la. And it's just like, I never thought of that. I never considered (laughs) what I'm bringing this band back to. I never even thought of that once. I was just like, you know what? I wrote a lot of music while I was doing other things. And I kind of want to play it at Red Rocks instead of like in my bedroom. Right. And I bet you the Biscuits want to play it, too. And yeah. then I called those guys, and they were like, yeah, let's go play it at Red Rocks. And we did. And so it just seems like 
I don't have that perspective of the world where I see what I look like standing on the planet. Yeah. And, yeah. and in, in some ways, it makes me very blind. Well, that's okay because it's your life. And like, this is like this idea that we only could have one career is kind of bullshit. Yeah. And a lot of people are, yeah, some people fucking hammer me with that. I hate when people say, like, oh, Matt, are, you know, good at a lot of things, but not a master at something. Jack of all trades, master of none. I hate you. I hate that fucking saying. I'm sorry I'm good at multiple things. How's that bad? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, look, if you're like Tom Brady, if you want to be like Tom Brady, maybe, maybe you can't. Right. Yeah. Take your eye off the ball, you know? Like maybe you can't. And you know, I'm pretty good musician, but like even I don't know if I, I I don't know. Like music is such a lonely job sometimes. Yeah. You know, like how do you how do you do, you know, how do you do what Jerry Garcia did? Like I thought about that so many times when I was coming up. You know, Jerry used to do a tour with the Grateful Dead where you, who knows how much acid they were taking, right. you know? Yeah, right. And it was t- twice a show, at least, minimum. Like, who knows what was going on in the after party? And then Jerry would get home, park that set of luggage, pick up another set of luggage, and go out for nine more weeks with the Jerry Band. Yeah. Oh, my God. And, and I was just like, you know, I don't know if I could do that. That sounds crazy to me. Yeah. But in, in 1974, it might have been the coolest thing to do. You know, what sure. were you doing? You know, but I don't it, It's It seems like people make different choices that suit them. And yeah. uh, I mean, he can't around the either. country. <laughs> you know? Yeah. To, you really got to be into like, also like, you know, a lot of musicians are smaller than me. So traveling is easier when you're yeah. smaller. Oh, yeah. you mean like physically? Like, or yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I thought I thought he meant like they're not as famous, so they have to travel. <laughs> you just mean like they're shorter than you. <laughs> yeah, like literal yeah, physical yeah, size, yeah, like yeah. dimensions. <laughs> like if I was to FedEx you, how big of a box would I need? Yeah, a smaller you know box than I mean? you for sure. Yep. <laughs> yeah, for maybe for me, just as wide. Need like four boxes taped together and shit, <laughs> and it would be very painful for me. It would yeah. be terrible. You, you you talk about the loneliness of being a musician, but then the next occupation you do is extremely lonely as well. Coding. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> I know. So dumb. So dumb. What, what, so what? <laughs> maybe you just don't like people. No, I love people, dude. I love people. I, I I'm a very happy guy. I got a lot of great friends. I I you and I hit it off immediately. Yeah, that's you know, true. it's just I I don't really have a thing with people. I just um. You know, I just, when I'm, like, doing, like, really, really deep thinking, sometimes I feel like other people get in the way. Like, the thing I like about computer programming is you don't have to get approval from anyone. You just need to run it on the computer. And the computer will just bork or it won't. Mm -hmm. And I just found that to be, and music is kind of similar. You sit down with the guitar, you could play the song, and just nobody can stop you. So I kind of like that in a way. Um, you know, I, I always feel like people are telling me why I can't do stuff, mm-hmm. you know, like people are telling me my whole career, like, don't be a musician. You're, you can't be a musician. You don't sing well enough to be a musician. Hmm. You'll never play a guitar like Jerry Garcia, you know, like all these things. I mean, the guy pulled me, uh, we played a gig when we were playing bars in Philadelphia and a guy came to write an article about us. It was like our first article ever. And I went over to talk to him and he pulled me aside and was like, you should quit tomorrow. You're the worst. Your whole band sucks. <laughs> what? I wonder what you, he's doing and now. I was, yeah. This fucking guy, Kyle Ober said this to me. When, I still remember his fucking name. Fuck you, Kyle. I was just like, yeah. Yeah. I was like, what are you talking about, dude? Like, why would you say that to me? I was like 20 at the time. It was like our 10th or 20th gig. I was like, why would you bother <laughs> to say that? Yeah, let's so squash just, like, this kid's this dreams. Weird world. This is weird world that I live in, where people are people are nuts. So, like, when you talk yeah. to a computer, like a computer isn't nuts. A computer's like round peg does not fit in square hole. Try again. That's yeah. all you get. That's all you get. Yeah, and, like that to me is is uh, objective, is soothing a little bit. It's yeah, frustrating, it's the, but it's also soothing. It's the idea of not having a boss. You're the boss, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the one thing. I don't know if I'm good with bosses. What about managers? Like, how many managers have you had? We had uh, Metallica's old manager was our <laughs> manager at one really? point. That's fun. Yeah, Johnny Zazula and his wife. Um, 
they were pretty good managers for the Biscuits. I think we got going with them, but they just wanted us to sign all these contracts that were insane, like you owe us money forever and right. your foot belongs to us and we are now the overlords of your whole family and you have to drink your blood. They had all <laughs> sorts of crazy contracts. <laughs> and and so, um, so we moved on from them. We had uh, the old manager of Wetlands, Chris Zahn, was our manager. I think he was one of our better managers, but he was super weird, and I don't know what happened to him. But I thought he did a really good job with the band, so it's a shame that we didn't work out with him. We had one of my buddies from high school was our manager, and yeah, That's... he just he, he was very bad with money. We just like <laughs> he would spend money and never pay any bills. And next thing I knew, we were like hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, Jeez. and we had Holy no way to pay it. We had no right. way to pay this stuff. And we were just like, why did you do this? And he's like, well, we needed the money to do other stuff. Just, so he's just bad at running businesses, but a great guy. <laughs> and then... Uh, great, great trade David's, manager. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great guy. Bad with money. And then we had David Sonnenberg, who was managing the Black Eyed Peas yeah. at the time. And um, we just couldn't... You know, we just I don't, I don't know if we were the kind of band for him, but I liked him. And, uh, and then we had Kevin Morse, Alex Brawl, who were our managers, but they really just were just partying with the band. Like, yeah. They really weren't <laughs> managing us. And then um, and we've managed ourselves a few times in the year. Evan Winokur is our manager right now from L.A., so we have, like, the L.A. manager right now. You know, it's just like... Do you like it? Do you like having someone tell you what to do, or is it? have they learned that they're not going to put Barbara in the corner? <laughs> the problem Nobody with the managers Barbara is they the never tell me what to do. Yeah. How did I get this podcast? I called you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's true. I have yet to have a manager that's like, I booked you on the Andy Frasco podcast. The podcast makes sense for you. You're booked. Go do the podcast. I didn't right. know that manager we never had. And then you see like Radiohead on the road. You watch their, do their documentaries and stuff like that of all these bigger bands. And all they're doing is sitting on some kind of like weird you know, celluloid model carousel where they go from one flashing room to another sure. flashing room. And occasionally they get asked in Japanese through a translator what the title of their new album means. Right. Yeah. And it's just like, <laughs> and it's like that, what is that? You know, right. that never happens. When, when we went to Japan, Mark and I took the tra the translators to the museum and like hung out with them and like partied with them. We didn't do any press. Uh, <laughs> Interviews. I don't remember. Nobody brought us in for an interview. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my, even during, it's, it's just so fascinating to me because you guys are super smart dudes. You guys went to Penn, right? We we went to college, yeah. We went to, we went to good colleges. Ivy League. And barely survived. I mean, <laughs> I don't even think we did survive. I, yeah. I mean, we, we were supposed to go to these weird classes where they teach you stuff, but we like <laughs> went on the road and played bars in New Hampshire and stuff yeah. like that. So, so we, I, I don't know how good our education is if I was to go into the workforce right now and you be got like, the piece oh, of paper, I need a job. Yeah, yeah, but like you still made that work while doing it. It's just the type of brains you have is pretty remarkable, Barbara. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what I used to do is I used to, um, I spent two weeks trying not to sleep. That was one thing that I did where I just wouldn't let myself sleep for two what? weeks. No drugs, no drugs, totally sober. I tried to beat sleep failed um i used to walk around the place that i lived there's a little library that i used to walk around there all ends of night like singing these songs out loud to myself and everybody kind of thought i was nuts so i think that i was just the relative the, the resident crazy person at that time i also was completely broke like my parents didn't give me any money for college so sure. i didn't have any money and i didn't want to get a job because i felt like the second i got a job I wouldn't be able to write music anymore, yeah. which is totally false and completely wrong. But at the <laughs> time, I was like, I, I'd rather sleep in a box on the side of the road and write music than have a job, even if it meant, you know, being able to, you know, eat something besides ramen noodles for a while. And um, yeah, we ate a lot of ramen noodles in those days. And we didn't like, I kind of missed out on the cotillions or whatever people do, like the fun stuff. But I started a band, and that was that was what I was into. That's what I wanted to do. I wrote a lot of songs in college, and we still play a lot of those songs today. So those songs were were like uh, written durable. They were written for the long haul. Why did your parents not give you any money for college? Were you, weren't you well off? Were you well off or no? Did you get in for scholarship? I mean, my dad was was you know to his credit because he never really made a lot of money ever in his entire life. Um, he never had a decent year. He never made any money in the stock market, but that 
guy saved and looked after every penny that he got. And so he definitely was the reason I was able to do these kind of cool things. And he did, he, it wasn't easy for him to do it. So I give him a lot of credit for that. But he didn't have any extra money for me to go take and spend on beer. Right, you know, right, like right, right. we didn't have TV in my house when I was a kid, which kind of might be part of the reason why I'm like such a good guitar player is so at least comfortable on the instrument right. because like I was playing guitar from a young age. There was what the kids do. do in their house. They watch cable. We never had, I never had cable. I didn't have cable till I was 28 years old and it <laughs> came with the apartment that I was living in. Oh and so, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you're that was my growth. man, Barbara, you're a caveman. Yeah. Was, man. yeah it's kind of grew up in the middle of nowhere. Uh, uh, there was only like, you could only see like two houses from where our house was in the middle of the woods there were deer everywhere. We would just leave the doors open and our dogs would just run in and out of the house. Like we didn't even have to close the doors. And um and so the dogs just like lived on the whole area, like the whole part. Um and yeah, and I would walk to school. So I didn't even really do any. I just get leave the house in the morning and I would le- go feed myself and go to school and come home and play guitar and go to bed. And then wake up and do it again. I might not see my parents for like six days. Wow. Mm-hmm. Like, who your, knows where they were? What about, um, what was your relationship with your mom? Uh, me and moms are cool. Like, she's very cool. She's a scientist. Um, she was, uh, she's very smart. She was basically, um, you know, just, I don't know. She's, we get along really well. I think I take after her a little bit more than my dad. And, are they divorced? Um, or are they um, together still? They're still together. They're still wow. like a rock. Those two are like a rock. They just, uh, they just, every only year child? goes by. No, I have an older brother uh, okay. and an older sister. Oh, okay. Okay. Same. Uh, yeah. Same as me. Yeah. That's why we relate to each yeah, other. Yeah. Um, youngest. Yeah, exactly. Why well, are you youngest? I'm youngest. youngest third? They're older. Of yeah, three. Th- of yeah. three, yeah. Six years older than me. Yeah, I'm trying to like this. This is my whole argument for having three kids because I have one kid and I will probably have another one. But the third kid is really under debate. And I really want to have the third kid because like, the, we're the third kid and look yeah. how cool and interesting yeah. we are. It's yeah. true. OK, you said you didn't have any money in college. How did you have money to get alcohol for the for the haircuts <laughs> drinks? That's a good question. I did something that I definitely regretted like the day after I did it. <laughs> I sold my cafeteria pass for cash <laughs> oh my god so you didn't have a meal and plan i immediately regretted it the very next day <laughs> yeah. when i tried to sneak into the cafeteria and they were like get the fuck out of here and i was like oh i fucked up no I meal plan the whole year <laughs> yeah i had like 700 dollars in cash but i like now i had no food and um and then i had to like scrap from there and figure out what to do to get money because i was going to eat at least 700 dollars worth of food and so, you know, I just started scrapping. You said you were good with numbers. Why why didn't you feel like you wanted to like be good at money? I don't because I just never used it my whole life. I didn't like yeah, like my dad never gave me like twenty dollars and was like, go spend this. Oh, you know, wow. I never had money my whole life. Like I walked to school, I walked home, like we didn't go out to places where you would spend money. I didn't go buy shoes. Like I wore my brother's shoes, you know, I don't, I didn't, I didn't have a life where like materialism was like a thing, you know, I just, I, I only got into material. I got into materialism for a couple years in like 2010. Cause it was like, it was popping. It was cool. And I was flush with cash. You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. right. so like I got into materialism, I bought a fucking watch <laughs> or whatever. It's just in a <laughs> yeah. drawer. I'm just, I'm just like, I don't know. It, New it, money. It is. I don't know. Stuff doesn't do much for me, but uh, I have a Nintendo Switch. I like that. That's a materialistic <laughs> thing that I dig. Who are you? Did you ever like fight any of those guys in the band? Did you ever like punch out Brownie? Like who? Who would you have the most beef with? I definitely Mark. I mean, I've punched Mark at least twenty times in the face. <laughs> at really? Least. Face? At Damn. least. At least. At least. I punched Sammy in the face multiple times. I've never punched Magner. I've never punched Magner in huh. the face. But Mark and Mark and I used to butt heads like it was our job. And why do you think and, it was? And, why do you think? You guys- I, it's, 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 I mean, look, Paul McCartney and John Lennon butted yeah. heads. Mm-hmm. Pink Floyd butted heads. It's the, it's the I'm 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 the 
the the king of this castle thing. All the guys do it with other guys. It's right. It's nothing unique to the biscuits, except right. the, for the biscuits. It was like, you know, it was like a uh, it was trench warfare for the right. biscuits. What was the was biggest like, fight? <laughs> Good morning. Who's killing who today? You know what I mean? It was just <laughs> yeah. like so crazy for. What a while. was the biggest blowout between you and Brownie? I mean, there were so many. I don't know. I don't remember. I mean, the band broke up like 17 times. I don't know. <laughs> I, I threw a, a bottle at Sammy once for no reason, right. except for I was pissed because, hey, you hey, know. Bo, my pa- I got you. Sorry. It's, it's our camera. Who's, who's quit the band more times? You or Brownstein? Is it? Uh, I'd like to say Mark. Definitely Mark. He no quit question. for like a year once, didn't he? I mean, and you had a different, yeah, And you had a different bass player? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, that the- was 2000, I think. Yeah. yeah something like that. Oh my god. Okay. This is so fascinating to me. I'm just blown away by this. So you basically you guys blew up, you were over yeah. it, you came back, and then COVID, and yeah, now right. you're and now you're back at it. Why did you Yeah, literally I we announced the bands getting back together and then like 38 days everybody 38 <laughs> days later everyone else in the music everyone in the music business gets fired <laughs> by the government you know what I mean <laughs> set break is not over anymore <laughs> set so, break yeah set break's over get in an ambulance and drive in circles right while, so let's go know. to this hiatus years when you went into coding and stuff All right. the, was the band pissed I, yeah, yeah, but no, no one was going to tell me because they'd been pissed at me about so many things in the past. They knew I just wasn't going to listen. You right, know? Yeah. I mean, it was like, what do I care? Did uh, what did, do I care? Did you guys have enough money to like? It wasn't as big of a financial issue. It was more about playing as a band. Like, were you guys okay financially for you to take the hiatus, or was it kind of like the livelihood was like on stop for a second? Oh, I mean, I was loaded in those years. I mean the. Uh, the band still made money because we didn't cancel any of the shows that I didn't have the balls to cancel. Like, I didn't have the balls to cancel Red Rocks. Yeah. Right. I didn't have the balls to cancel The Man in Philadelphia. You know, I, you know, all these, like, we were playing the theater at MSG. I, like, these shows where it's, like, there's 5,000, 6,000 people there, like, or more sometimes. Like, Electric Force, there was, like, 40,000 people Holy there. Holy shit. It's just, like, I can't, I can't cancel those shows. You know, yeah. I can't say that, I, you know... I might have been a better computer programmer if I was like not uh, disappearing on weekends to do Camp Bisco. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, maybe, so, maybe not though. Maybe it helped too. Yeah, you know? like we never canceled Camp Bisco once. So we did. We did all the Caribbean holidays in those years. So I had a, still had a pretty full schedule, um, and I was getting paid really well off those full schedules because those were all the money dates. You right. Know? We right. Can, we canceled the ones that didn't. That were like you know Cincinnati on a Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cincinnati, yeah. <laughs> love Cincinnati, but the Tuesday night shows anywhere in the country don't really pay that great. Right, and so we were making great money off of that. Plus, I was like starting companies and building this like crazy code where I was getting paid very well to be the idiot in the room, basically. Yeah, and um, yeah, I don't know. I was I was raking it in in so those years. Where'd so. you see? Where'd you? Okay, so what gave you the vision that you wanted to code? Give me it. Uh, I was working with a buddy of mine when I was in the band, and he was building me stuff that I was just kind of like saying, oh, this would be dope. Can you build me a computer program that writes all my... Like, the way that I wrote set lists was always very much like, okay, we wanted these songs, we want to have in a rotation... These songs we played last time, we don't want to play them again, but we just want to play one of them in case somebody was at that show. They'll recognize one song, but they don't know the band. So we would do one song repeated from last time we were in Cincinnati, and then we would have a rotation of songs going on where all the songs are fresh. So, And I was just like, why am I doing this? Like, Why am I sitting around figuring this stuff all out? Computer would do this in two seconds and spit out the whole tour for me. So we built that. And then we, um, and he did all the code and I would just ask him to build stuff and, and he would build it and then we would work on it together. And we did a bunch of stuff together. And then he made a company called group me, which is like a group messaging app. He made it at a biscuit show, like how to keep in touch at a biscuit show. And then they got funded and they went and made that app. And when he made that app, he's like, I can't build any more of your dumb ideas. Cause I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm a yeah. job now. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what about my dumb ideas? What about the half done ones? And he was like, you could do them yourself. Just teach yourself how to do it. Right. It'll take you a little while, but you'll figure it out. 
And I was like, after a while, I was like, nah, I could never teach myself how to do that. And then let me tell you, yeah, anybody could teach themselves how to do that. It sounds crazy, but it's not. It's a difficult. language, right? I mean, yeah, it's like speaking Spanish. If you yeah. went to Spain and and spoke Spanish every day, like in four months, you'd be great at speaking Spanish. It's the same thing. Four months later, you'd be great at it. And that's it. So what was the one, what was the idea that you thought was the best idea of all of these half ideas that made you want to finish it? I mean, look, Splice, the company Splice. Um, what is that for the people who don't know what Splice is? Splice is a company that my friend who who I'm talking about is the CEO, well, not the CEO anymore, but he built Splice really from scratch. I, I like kind of coaxed him into doing it because I thought it was a brilliant idea and just really worked hard to try and get him to apply his brain power to a problem in the music business, which mm -hmm. is what I was thinking was, man, wouldn't it be great if this super smart guy would help musicians, you know, because super smart guys are always doing things for people, but rarely do musicians get too much benefit from, right. yeah. you know, that stuff. You know what I mean? Like Elon Musk has got a lot of companies, but record company is not one of them. You're right. <laughs> and so you... <laughs> yeah, true. So you, ha so you have like... Uh, so Splice is, is basically like, it's like Netflix for music samples. You know, like if you want to make a hip hop song, you need samples for kick drums, snare drums, bass lines, keyboards. You need samples for all that stuff. Or you need a band and nobody has a band anymore. So everybody needs samples. And Splice is where you go to get those samples. And the Splice is like, it's like Netflix. You pay a couple bucks a month and you get all the samples you want and you can make any kind of music you want. And um, so that was a great idea that ended up, I mean, Splice is going to be on the NASDAQ someday. Huge, yeah. And, uh, you know, to, but that's the thing about computer code is like, it's this weird, it's this, that's why I went into it. Cause I was like kind of jealous that I'm like walking around the country, like with bare feet, like playing <laughs> acoustic guitar for people. <laughs> and like, there are these dudes who are making like robots that go to outer space and like urinate right. on a rock and then come back down. And it's just like crazy what these people are building. It's um, you know, it feels weird to be in a jam band in this era, but I do love writing music, so it's it's tough. It's tough. Fuck it, Bar Barbara, you are a fascinating motherfucker, dude. <laughs> can, I, can we? How much time do we have with you? Can we keep going? Um, you know what? I'm supposed to be on the Today Show, but let me just send him a text <laughs> to cancel real quick. <laughs> Al Roker can yeah, wait. Yeah, Al Roker. I know he has cancer, but he can wait. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> Jesus. All, All right. right. We'll, we'll, we'll mute that. Um, <laughs> talk All about right, what do you, Are we on Cloud Cord still? Or are we shifting yeah, Cloud Cord. To... No, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, I want to talk right. a little bit about Splice, and then we'll get into the music a little more. So Yeah, let's talk about you Splice. Got, you got bought out? No, no, no. I, I, still, I still own a piece of the company or whatever that means. I don't know. I'm never going to see that money. I'm going to... Who knows? You know what I mean? It's, it's it, I, I'm not, I don't know. It is what it is. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's cool. It's good. But like, you have to wait for the company to like sell or something. Yeah. And that company is probably going to go public, I hope. And if that company goes public, I'm not selling then. No. So no, I'm that's just not like, when you I just sell. like own this paper that makes me feel good. That's yeah. about it. But it's, it's cool. And I really love the product. I get to use the product for free, which is great. Does you know, the product's that, amazing. Does Mark get jealous that you make more money than him? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably. I, I don't know if I do. Mark has like nine jobs. Mark Mark's makes a, a lot of money. He's got, he's got Lively. He's got 10 other bands. Yeah. I, I don't think I've ever... We made the exact same money for years, and then Mark made more money than me because Memphis was like on a compilation or something, and he oh. wrote Memphis, so he got a big check for that. And that was the only time we ever didn't make the same amount of money. And he made more money than me. So he probably always makes more money than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll clap to that. Shout like out to Mark. Mark? <laughs> I, I, yeah. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm not great at making money. I, I think mm. I've proven that over the years. I just, you know, I just do what I do. Yeah. Are, oh. you, are you still CEO of Couch Store, too? Or do you still work with that? Yes. Yeah. What's that? Couch Store's dope. We did the New Year's shows. We, we, had, we broadcasted everything. Um, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't call myself a CEO because I, I well, wake I up and write music all day. <laughs> yeah, that's. I put that on LinkedIn just to you know right. throw people off the scent a little bit. I mean, if you if you put on your LinkedIn like I'm a professional guitar player, you, people just block you for no exactly. reason. Exactly. Yeah. 
Okay, I got a question. I got a couple questions. I got I have a lot of questions. This might be a two part episode. This might we might have to do another one of these because I I have a lot of things we need to talk about. You might have to be the in special. Studio. Yeah, you special co host sometimes. Um, do you get? I mean, you, I, I would do the in, in studio thing. Uh, you know, next time. Yeah, when you're in Denver one. for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel like you're one of the first wave bands who really embraces electronic music. Do. And no one gives you the credit for it, which is bullshit. Do you get pissed off at these guys who are ripping you off all the time? <laughs> yeah, all the time. All the time. I want to send them all cease and desist letters. <laughs> all awesome. these other, What's Sue's you know Sound what I Tribe? Mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, everybody's... everybody's uh, I, I don't know. I also feel like, in a way, that it's kind of um, the one little... You know, it's the one little award that we get as the Disco Biscuits is that we're very, very emulated band by the True. newer generation. Yeah, for sure. You know, every, every one of the newer jam bands has their Disco Biscuit mode. Yep. You know, they all have a fish mode, and now they all have a Disco Biscuit mode, too. So I feel like it It's kind of makes me feel like maybe we've been listened to and been making good music, at least among the musicians and stuff like that. Yeah. But, like, the Biscuits were the only ones doing Techno Jam Party for a long time. Right. Um, we just kind of, like, were too early in that when the techno thing happened, people were aggressively against the instruments that were used to make normal rock and roll, like guitars right. and string bass. Right. And all the real techno guys that came up kind of eschewed all that stuff and refused to use any of those instruments and just went straight electronica with it. And um, and we're like, Kraftwerk is our biggest influence, was like the thing that everybody <laughs> would say because it was like cool to say that or something. Right. And um, and like, so we're trying to make techno with these instruments, but these instruments are not used anymore. So it's kind of interesting. That was one thing where I wish we would have made more of a switch and just kind of moved past the instruments if we really wanted to make like proper techno, but... Right. You know. What about um are you the type of guy that cares about having his flowers? Like do you, does that something that you care about? People giving you the respect you deserve or do you not care you just do your own thing? I yeah, I don't think we're ever going to get it. You know, I I don't I, I'm not going to like sit out and like expect people to to care. I mean, I feel like I've gotten some flowers over the years like we want to jammy and like I've hung out with every musician that I ever idolized as a peer, which was something that was really important to me when I was younger. It was like, you know, I met the guys in Fish when I was like 15, but then I met them again as a and like as a musician. And that was big for me. I really enjoyed that. I met all the members of the Grateful Dead besides Jerry as a peer. And it was very cool. Um, so that was that was something that I liked. Um I just don't know if we're like a consistent brand to like wow people on on the level that you need to be musically, and I I don't know why we don't do that, but it's it just doesn't happen, I guess. I don't know. What? Flowers? What flowers would you give the biscuits? Honestly, what <laughs> flowers would we receive? I, I mean, you, you maybe mean, roses. I don't know. Yeah, tulips. Colored tulips. I got a mix. lot of roses and tulips in my day. Yeah. I feel pretty good about it. You know, it's like life. Life has been pretty good, and and we've had a long career in the music business. I guess we could win a Grammy at some point, and that would just like legitimize our whole position. Maybe I don't know, but you yeah. know, what else is there to win? I mean, right. we won a Jammy when they were Jammies, and then they stopped doing that. I mean, I think maybe that's something you could do. Is like you're pretty good at making a show, and you're a personality that's larger than life. You could bring back something like the Jammies. Where people like do it's an award show, but for live musicians, right? We'll shoot it on Couch Door. We'll put it on Couch Door. We already have the award yeah, show. Too. We have the award show. Yeah. What do you like? What do you like better? Do you like playing live or being in the studio? Um, well, I used to be terrible at being in the studio, so I always like playing live better. But now I'm getting really good at being in the studio because I do a lot of practice. I'm trying to like teach myself how to be good at being in a studio, how to be useful. And how to be able to get things done when I don't have people who know how to do stuff, like make drum beats, bass lines. So a lot of like the new Disco Biscuit album, a lot of those songs have like demo versions that me and Magner made. And those are, uh, I play them on my podcast from time to time. And they're they're kind of dope. Like I might actually put them out because they're they're very electronic and they're a little bit different than the band version. 
but it, they're still really good. So, you know, that's like more production in the studio is kind of coming in the future, I think. What do you think your next um, get off the track per se ideas? Like, you know how you did the coding? What's the next I one I think that's you? Baba G is my next get off the track idea, honestly. Oh, yeah. Oh, the DJ set? Yeah. Yeah, the thing I did at your show. I Remember liked how, it. like, fucking excited I was about you it? Stoked. It's just like, it's like so weird and random and no one else in the world is doing it. And like, those are the kind of ideas that I end up like diving into a little bit so too aggressively. It, what is it? Is it different than like a regular DJ set then or... If I play a song that's a song that you know, like let's say, like what do you listen to? Just ABBA, or do you listen to any just other ABBA? Actually, music? yeah, you nailed it. Just ABBA. <laughs> so, so if I played like an ABBA song, it would be not ABBA. No one in ABBA would be in the song. It would be me recreating the song. Okay, live okay, on the spot. okay, cool. Just like if you sat down with a guitar and played a Bob Marley song, you it wouldn't be Bob Marley. You'd exactly. Be recreating the song, Baba G is the same thing, and nobody does that. Everybody who DJs. They play, they just go to, you right. know, Apple iTunes and they buy an ABBA song yeah, and they play it for you. Yeah. And, you know, me, I would perform it in a way. So I okay. feel like that's kind of like maybe because all these I sat in L.A. When I was living in L.A., man, I sat in studios all the time. And I was probably the most famous musician in most of those studios. And I was the least talented one in every single one of those studios. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> And and so like people know how to do these things, but they just don't have the tools and technology and somebody to figure out how to make it work for them. Right. And I think like when I when I get deep into Baba G and like I'm, I'm like creating stuff on the fly, like playing a piano or something, that mm -hmm. like other people are going to be do, able to do that as well and potentially a lot better than me. And it's going to be wild to see. So what it's happens. like live looping in Ableton kind of for a lot of it, or. Yeah, but I don't use loops okay. per se. I have ways of getting around the loop. To me, li the problem with live looping is the loop. So, it's repetitive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the system has to breathe and has to think musically. And so I'm like building little things to go into Babaji that make that happen. Okay. Which is like the sauce. That's, That's wild, the yeah. sauce. Oh, my God. That's and cool. Tell me about that. your time in L.A. Why'd you move to L.A.? Well, I started a gift card company that did <laughs> uh, online <laughs> gift cards. What? I started a company called It's On Me. It's still in business today. They do. If you ever go to a mm -hmm. restaurant website and you see the little button that says gift cards and you click yeah. that button and a little screen of gift cards comes up. Yeah. I made that. Oh, my um, God. And and when you buy something on there with your Canadian money, my our system would, uh, Convert. would handle that and... I they I mean I got I got uh the United States government tried to hack my computer system as a uh security measure to see so, if I could be trusted, I guess, because we were like our gift cards were starting to be used in casinos in Las Vegas as right. a form of money. And if you go into a, a, there's only so many things that are legally allowed to be used as a form of money in a casino. Right. It's cash, chips, uh player cards. And my gift cards. Let's go. And so, Whoa, that's a yeah. clap to that. And so I and so to get approved by the Las Vegas Casino Commission, they ha they hire some like Russian troll farm to hack your shit. Oh, that makes and sense. And like though, literally, yeah. and they don't tell you when that you pay them money. You give them twenty this is how it works. You give them twenty five thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. That's yeah. a lot. And yeah. then you never hear from them again. Wow. And then one night you are asleep in your bed trying to sleep off the weekend's disco biscuit shows or whatever. Right. And then every alarm you have attached to your computer system goes off all at the same time. And Whoa. 80 million robots from around the world start trying to hack your stuff. Damn. It's like a movie. And I woke up and honestly, I was just staring at the screen. There's nothing I could do. Like it was so out of nowhere, out of the blue and intense that I'm just watching the computers complain, complain, everything's good. And I'm just like, oh my God. Nothing my you can do. Is over. Hope and pray. I didn't even know what it was. And then I called my partner and was like, what's going on? And like we fretted about for a while. And then we got on the phone with another guy from the company who was like, it's probably that he's seen it before. So he knew kind of what it was. And then they called us back two months after that and were like, you're approved for money in the casino <laughs> in Las Vegas. 
You must have oh some good security. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So did, were, did you like trust? Your, did you knew your your program was trustworthy? You knew it was no. okay. No. No. No idea. No idea. I mean, look, oh. I built it as well as I could, but I don't know what I'm doing. I'm a fucking idiot, dude. I barely play guitar. I mean, it's just. <laughs> I, I, I don't even know how we survived it. I just got lucky. Maybe they, maybe I happened to be, you know, I use these systems that claim to help you in these type of things and maybe they helped. I don't know. Maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they broke it and didn't have the heart to tell us. I don't know. But nothing <laughs> bad happened and they approved us. So we must have yeah. gotten through it. But, you oh know, it's, it's, it's like there's that thing that, you know, whenever you, people always talk about the thing that like you don't know anything until you know enough to know that you know nothing. Yeah. And I think in the computers, I I understand that I don't know anything. You know, I I get what? that. Right. That's for sure. Oh my god! So tell me, you know, tell me about this hot air balloon, this this rock opera. Why did you even want to do a rock opera? Can you explain exactly what a rock opera is? Yeah. For people who. Okay, so uh, a rock opera is a, like a term. Like okay, so you know there was classical music. They made operas, and then. Yeah. Obviously, when the rock guys came around, there was a lot of those guys know a lot about classical music, so they did operas like the classical guys did, but they were rock guys, so they just called it a rock opera, and that's it. And yeah. there's tons of them. <laughs> um, Tommy is a good uh, one. Yeah. The Grateful Dead has Terrapin Station, which was you know considered by the band to be kind of a rock opera. They have, uh, I mean, the Grateful Dead has so many story songs; it's insane. So you could probably pick other ones out of their catalog. The Who had Tommy, which was the big pop one that was super famous. Fish had Game Henge. Um, I feel like Rush had Twenty One Twelve. If you remember mm -hmm. that, um, there's just a ton of them. I mean, you could really go on for days. And I was uh, starting the biscuits out. I had a lot of music sitting around and I didn't know what necessarily to sing about. And I basically was like, well, how do I, I have so much music and no lyrics. What am I going to do? And I was like, maybe it's time that I write my rock opera. It seems like every other artist who is worth their salt has a rock opera that they wrote <laughs> around the same age that I am at, at that time. So I had this one song called Hot Air Balloon, which was the last song, the in a hot air balloon, that last song, which was like me kind of doing like a Bob Dylan song. So it's got that like weird rhyme scheme and it's very picturesque story. It's kind of like a Dylan song. And so I just had that song and I was like, you know, this song, I could write other parts of this song and put them over some of this other music. So if you hear like a song I have, like Bizarre Escape, which was like all the like Middle Eastern style music licks I had lying around packed into one song with the like him sneaking through town part in it. And then I just got deep on that because I wrote a beautiful love song called Fiddler, which set it up really nice. And then I kind of wrote a song about my girlfriend at the time because I was paying no attention to her and I was writing all the time. And so I wrote Very Moon kind of about her, but it was really about the character and the story. So yeah. there's like a lot of parallels in there. And the next thing you know, I had a rock opera. And you would think I would have made like a great album with that rock opera and stuff like that. But I feel like people hated me more for the rock opera than they really? loved me for it. Yeah, Weird. I feel like it caused a lot of problems. Like people <laughs> were like... <laughs> Brownie wrote know? one too, right? He wrote Brownie one right a, after yeah. that. Yeah, he did. Mm. He wrote Chemical Warfare Brigade right after that. He got jealous. Which is... I mean, his is cool too. I mean, I yeah, helped cool, him yeah. write his. His is pretty cool too. You know, everybody, it's easy. It's not hard to write a rock opera. I mean, I just finished the space opera that we're putting out in May or April. Oh, cool. And um, and it's it's a good thing to work on a larger piece of work because like every day you can wake up and hustle on it. And like, you don't have to sit around figuring out, oh, what is this poignant moment? You know, or you don't have to do the thing that all the L.A. guys do, which is like, you know, and I, I, people did this like right in front of me. And I was just like, what is wrong with you? Where they would like <laughs> they would like listen to the top 10 songs on the billboard and write down what each song is about and then be like, which one are we going to write today? Oh, and yeah. I just be like, what are you guys doing? Like, write yeah. a song. But people do that because if you write a song about like about, you know, if you use that as like a guiding light and. Maybe you get your own story out that way. I don't know. But it just seemed very much like uh, it was. It felt like a very clout chasey way to write music. But if you have like a nice space opera story like I have with the new album, you have 
you know, you could sit around and be like, okay, I need this song, I need that song, I need that song. You could listen right. to all the different music you have and match like interesting pieces of music that you would never use for anything. You could fit them into these little situations and it's it becomes very uh you know, it becomes big after a while. You're like, wow, I can't believe all those different things fit together and creates this big piece. Wow. What a fucking life. Do you hear this guy talk? Yeah, I'm, I got the headphones on. Yeah, I can. Barber. <laughs> you, I, I feel like you, you are one of those thinkers like Steve Jobs. You're like one of those guys who have these big ideas, you know? Yes. And you execute. I agree. I totally agree with that. <laughs> I'm just like Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I kind of have another tech question, though. What do you got? Um, it, it goes to back to the streaming thing. What do you think is the future for like Web three and virtual reality when it comes to streaming live shows and stuff like that? Well, I mean, look, Couch Tour is is I built Couch Tour, and you know, I know a little bit, but it, it's it's pretty easy to build a streaming site. I feel like um, I'm surprised there aren't more of them, but at the same time, it's a lot of work and it's very nebbishy. So you got to be up for that. Um, I think Web3, obviously, there's a big hype circle. It works really well, but I just feel like the powers that be, like, why would they want want Web3 to happen? And I just feel like it's cool that that it's like, you know, it it is the future on some level, but I really feel like the problem with Web3 to me is it's, it's like the gateway drug to complete fascism. Exactly. You know, like yeah. the second cash <laughs> that's disappears. What, that's exactly what I think. Yeah. You know, like the second cash disappears, and and you know they say like you control your Bitcoin, but the second they turn off the internet, you don't control your Bitcoin anymore. Yeah. You know Especially what I mean? Like wallet, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, if you had a suitcase full of cash in the seventies, you could run. You know, and like you can't run. When the, and the second they get rid of cash, it's over. So I mean, people. Are like in love with Web three and stuff like that, and I get it, but the people who are going to control that are not. It's the people who control things that that you know might abuse the power of control are are sure. going to control that stuff if it if right. it gets to the point where it's right. ubiquitous. You know, going to so, make them lose money. Yeah. So it's kind of scary to me. I feel like Web three is very scary. Um, you know, I feel like AI is very scary too. I mean, especially like next month, there could be a music AI bot that's out, and right. you could make, and that thing could make a space opera in like nine minutes. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, it took just me a whole year is. to write yeah. this damn space opera. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can definitely have a bot write you chord changes and lyrics right now. Like I've seen it in the chat stuff with yeah. GPT. Yeah, like but those chord tell them- changes, those chord yeah. changes are so dumb. You know? What I mean? Yeah, yeah, they're bad, but they're gonna get better probably. They are going to get better. And then once the robot figures out how to watch your brain react to the music that it's playing you. Yeah. Like it's like I'm I'm retiring on that day. Like when they're like, our robot looks at the crowd and puts frequencies into the speakers that adjust your face while you're staring back at it. That's the day Mm -hmm. I quit the music business. It's going to be like, exactly. You know what I mean? It's just like, how am I supposed to compete with that? You know, like yeah, exactly. it studies your face using an algorithm developed by TikTok, <laughs> and it uses the wideness of your eyeballs to decide whether or not it should keep hammering you in the face with bass lines. It's yeah. just like, oh no. <laughs> it only has millions of years of society to learn from. You're okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, they already have like AI rappers and stuff like that. So for sure, it's, right? It's only a matter of time. I got about another yeah. three years. Everybody, we all musicians, we got like three more years. So yeah. if you're gonna write a good song, right? it tonight because yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) well barber it's been a pleasure thank you this is round one round one round one i love it i love it man this is this is great stuff and uh, i'm you know i i just wanted to say because i've never been on a podcast that i've been able to say this but uh i'm a (laughs) listener of this podcast i've listened to at least 15 episodes i listen to you guys all the time i think you guys have great chemistry thank you and um and I just really like you guys interview people that I know, and it's fun to hear everybody talk. And I'm a big fan of this podcast. Can we uh, can we call you sometimes? Can we call you in sometimes when we have questions about tech. the AI and tech and stuff? Can you be our tech advisor for the World Saving Podcast? Yeah, I'd love that. I'd love, any excuse <laughs> yes. to fly to Colorado? That's a, that's a good excuse for me. I mean, oh, yeah. I'll come out there, hang out. We could do a Zoom, but yeah, if you want, no, you should come over. You have, come over here. It's always better nice. in the studio. Come yeah, over. Yeah. Let's hang out. Let's be friends. Let's go eat some sushi. 
Let's let's be some buddies. I don't know if you eat sushi. Maybe I mean, hack you, something. I don't know. Yeah, I'll go barefoot with you. Walk through the pillage. You know, I'll, I'll I mean, go you don't have shoes on right now. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm wearing shoes. Sorry. I'm I mean, look at that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, look, we he didn't get the memo. Friends, he didn't Barbara. get the memo about the shoes. It's fine. He didn't get the memo. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, thanks for being on the show. This is just round one. Appreciate this is going to be a lot. This is going to be a lot. You're yeah. going you're gonna, you're gonna to get sick of us pretty soon here, okay? All right. All right. Well, yeah. Right, but make sure you keep listening. <laughs> make sure well, I think that who's up next? Who's coming up? What's the what's Margaret going on Cho, next? I think Margaret Cho. No, Median. really? Yeah, I interviewed her this morning. It was amazing. Uh, I love She's that. Wild. I love that. Look at you guys, dude. It's Almost happening, bro. Let's go. So For you still sure, do the podcast? Dude. Where can people find your podcast? Touchdowns all day. It's touchdowns all day. It's on all the normal podcast networks. I'm about to do episode fifty. Um, I did. You know, I was doing it like every couple of weeks kind of not on the year level of frequency because i don't know how the hell you do that it's amazing but i do like once a month or something like that or maybe once every two weeks but like then i was in the studio every day finishing the album so now that the yeah. album is done and basically i don't you know there's two levels of done for the album there's you can hear it and it's on all major streamers and right. that's we're almost there but then there's i don't have any songs on a piece of paper that aren't written yet done uh, which is where i am at you know like i need this yeah. next song to be the best song and i'm over that level of anxiety so now i can go back to having fun and making right podcasts on. and you know traveling to colorado for no Damn. reason skiing and look, stuff like punch that. and brownie look at you how yeah. <laughs> punch and brownie yeah. <laughs> we're getting punched I love brownie. by brownie I you love know, Brownie. You never know. You never know. Has he Brownie. ever? Has he ever like hitting you really hard? Feels like he can't really. Oh hit. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Brownie has Brownie has caught me in the face a few times. But this that yeah. was when we were kids. That was we. <laughs> we don't do that anymore. We don't. No. We don't punch each other anymore. I mean, look, I st I had to. People had to stop. People sat me down and were like, "You need to stop punching things," because <laughs> my hands would break. And people oh, yeah, would be you like, broke your "What hand, are you right? doing? That's... Your you hands to to are your livelihood." Yeah. Don't answer this. Just wink at me. Have you ever yeah. had a threesome with Brownie? Oh, no, no, no. I can, I'll answer okay. that. Definitely okay. not. Definitely <laughs> and have we, is the reason... Have we never... I don't think have, so. I got to think Have you never that. punched Magner because of the height difference and you feel bad? Yeah. I would. If I punched <laughs> Magner, I would just... Probably hurt my shoulder or something. I don't know. <laughs> you need Tommy John surgery after that. No one ever nah. punches down. You got to punch up. Yeah, punch up. <laughs> punch or up. even, or even, <laughs> or even, or save. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right, Barbara, go go figure out you world hunger or something. We'll talk yeah. to you later. I right, started a new business during the pod. Later, buddy. Thanks later. for coming. Yeah, love you guys. <laughs> love you too. Later, man. That was fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs>